this series is called the QZ, the Quarantine Zone. I've borrowed that term from a video game, The Last of Us 2, which I've been playing far too much of at the moment. When lockdown started and the slower pace um, began, I had a lot of time to kind of think about people I wanted to collaborate with who I, I maybe just hadn't got around to doing before. So I sent out a couple of messages to people, um, including people outside London, where it's, it's not easy to work out the logistics of those type of things. So I sent out a couple of messages and was absolutely delighted to hear back from one or two people. And the first person was Sean. Um, so that inspired me to, um, to reimagine a couple of my pieces. Um, so tonight you're going to hear an old piece and a new piece, which is going to be on the next album. So a little bit about Sean Rickman. Hopefully he doesn't need too much introduction. Um, I met Sean at the Belgrade Jazz Festival. I was playing a set there, and Sean was playing with Steve Coleman afterwards. And we were just so delighted when we found this out. Um, and we, we watched the concert, and it, we had our minds blown. It was, it was great. And then um, there was a little bit of a kind of hang backstage afterwards, and I got talking to Sean, and I was saying, man, you know, I'd love to gig, and I'd love to play with you one day somehow. And he said, well, you know, I can record at my place, so if you want to send something, then, you know, we can do that. Um, so I did, and you're about to, um, to hear the result. Um, I'd just like to talk a bit about Steve Coleman's music now, and Kevin Glasgow, who's the bass player on the first piece. Back when I used to live in Edinburgh, I used to go to a bar called the Southern Cross Cafe, and Kevin Glasgow would play there with a drummer called Chris Wallace, Doug Tiplady on tenor sax, and Paul Kirby on the piano. And they would play stuff like um, Nuclear Burn by Brand X. And they, they played a version of Dizzy Gillespie's Groove in High, but they played it in Pi. Um, don't ask me about, you'll have to ask Kevin about that, maybe if he tunes in. You can. Um, and one piece they played was a Steve Coleman piece called The Towel of Mad Fat. So when I knew I was going to be collaborating with um, Sean, who's played so much with Steve, there was only one bass player who I was going to call. Now, Sean isn't actually on the recording that I was familiar with of The Towel of Mad Fat. It's Gene Lake. But Sean has recorded a great deal with Steve and also with Sean Lane. We're going to talk about that. Um, okay, so right, where better to start um, than with the first track on my first album? Um, we're going to play a new track at the end, and that's going to be with the amazing Matt Ridley on acoustic bass. That's a piece called Two Bridges, which is from my new album, which is coming out on the 24th of July, and you, I'm sure you'll notice plenty of information about that in the coming days. But without further ado, um, Let's start with Kanda Jati. Uh, it's me, Sean Rickman, Kevin Glasgow. I really hope you like it. Thank you so much for tuning in. And um, OK, let's go. Then there's going to be a bit of chat with Sean. Uh, give me some thumbs up if you can hear this. Oh, Arlene likes the shirt. That's good. Anyway, on with the music.
outside of the Washington, D.C. area. Okay. A suburb called Rockville, which is accurately titled for me. Rockville, <laughs> Maryland. And it's always been Rockville. It's been a real square place. I, I'm, I'm really a very uh, uh, blessed, spoiled black kid in middle class America. Yes. Okay. One, two, three, four is written across the top. And then under the one, two, three, four is written 14, 14, 14, 14. And then under that is five, 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 five. So that means four times each time it's a bar of 14 and a bar of five. Oh, uh, okay. It happens four times, like 14, five, 14, five, 14, five, 14, five. Yeah. Now, who, wants, who the fuck wants to think of 14, five? Nobody. Mathematicians. So, so I'm going to go seven, okay, just to be easier on my brain. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to count. I want to feel the shape because it creates, and the way that you play it mm -hmm. gives it a certain feel too. Mm -hmm. So off, the numbers will only give you like the limits, but they won't give you the feel. So a lot of drummers and stuff rely on numbers and they miss the feel because they're like, oh, I can play at seven and I can play at nine. It's like, eh, yeah, but what if you play with Steve Coleman where the bass line is in 11? And then the, then the melody's in seven, but then your accent and some cue, he wants you to throw in on any of that. Mm. It's a trick of the beat section on some James Brown shit. So you really can't rely on numbers to count because you get lost. So you have to know the shape, how it feels, where things meet. Mm. I'm listening to where the melody meets, what happens, the inflections. It's an environment. Mm. It's like a perfect storm. It's happening all the time. Mm. And you got to know all the ingredients to create that situation. You just can't think about you. Even if you, yeah, you're a highlight, you mm. still want to give everybody this, you know, the landscape. I mm. look at music like a landscape mm. where we're having a conversation. And we can be in a fucked up weather. Like in, like, in mm. Scotland. In <laughs> I love Scotland. But you're right. The weather is definitely not good. It's challenging, right? You gotta be a, a Scottish person to appreciate. It. Sean, have you ever been to Scotland? Yeah. Yeah. When, when were you there? Was it Edinburgh? Yeah. When were you there, was man? When about? I went there with Yannick Wisdala with the bass player. Uh, we had. I think this was a uh, 2008. Oh my I God, man! I was there then, but I had no idea that you were playing there. Or, yeah, we or who you were, right, probably. It was on this hill. You're probably right, probably right there. Like <laughs> this bar on on top of this hill. I think the university was over here. Yeah. It was up the hill. We were there for three nights, two or three nights with Ollie Rockberger. Great. And uh, me and uh, Yannick, man, we were getting down. We were doing it. Great. Um, 2008. 2008. Cool, yeah. man. Oh, shit. Man, it's raining. I need to bring in my washing. One sec. Oh, God. Ah. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm so sorry, Sean. I just want anyone watching this to know that Sean has been unbelievably patient um, helping me with the technology side and putting up with me dealing with my laundry. There's one or two things that I really want to ask you about. One of them is, is Sean Lane. Because for me, I'm, I, you know, I've always played guitar. It's my first instrument. I'm not a multi-instrumentalist like you, but I love jazz. I love Steve Coleman. And I also love amazingly virtuoso guitar players like Sean Lane. And I, I only actually did my homework recently and realized that it's you on those, on the Powers of Ten records like that. Oh, and that you play with Sean. So... You're straddling these two two sort of zones, which are such a yeah. big part of my, you know, reason for playing music. So, I mean, are there any fond memories at all? Or Sean Lane was an anomaly himself. His story was like mine. He was this guy who was living in the middle of square ass America. America has never been him. <laughs> England has always been more hip. England accepted all the black artists that America was too racist to show on TV. Wow. We're seeing little Richard Clips and Jimi Hendrix and all this shit that they didn't show in America. Oh, no. At that 
when we look at it in this sense, we're like, wow, look at it, it was so obvious. Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, 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 no. You're seeing clips that weren't shown to, wow. to share these things. Mm. I got stuff that you don't even, like that stuff I showed to myself that people are like, when did you do this? Yeah. Yeah. We have to understand, we have the share culture and the, can- and the cancel culture that goes along with it, and it's very dangerous. We, we, these are the great times, man. So, anyway, I'm kind of like opening a can of worms. It's great. Back to Sean Lane. Sean Lane was this obscure guy who was in Memphis, Tennessee, and I read about him. Uh, I can go get the issue of Guitar Player Magazine. Um, Cause I'm a guitar player and I'm like, I'm like a guitar player trapped in a drummer's body. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I would cause all this guitar memorabilia and there was this issue called the unknown greats. And we had a guy here named Danny Gatton. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That I didn't even know about cause I was too young. Mm. You know, I was born in 1970. So these guys were doing clubs and I was just getting out of high school. So the Sean Lane thing came out, I think it was, 92 or something because mm. I hooked up with him in 90 what was that 93 yeah so yeah end of 92 alright so I read this thing about Sean Lane and Kirk Hammett and, and all these guys talk about this cat in Memphis and I was like okay my man Angelo Earl who's this southern brother from Memphis and uh, he's working with this company called Arden and I went out and did this uh, demo for Artic. They were trying to shop me to record labels with my music. And then they had uh, been successful in landing a contract with Eric Gales, right? Mm-hmm. The young guitarist. He got signed to a two-album deal with Electra Records. They were trying to do the same with me. The difference was Eric had uh, a live band. I was just a studio kid. I was mm-hmm. a studio kid. So it was kind of hard for them to see my whole thing. I was coming all psychedelic. I didn't have a band. I had all these tunes on a four track and they were at the time it was like color me bad i want to set you up so a brother like me in america doing the rock thing and the hair metal thing was dying mm. grunge was coming out he really didn't know i could see why i was weird to why i was like this weird dude you know mm. but anyway that that was what was happening angelo was like a staff producer or or at artist and Ardent was known for recording guys like Stevie Ray Vaughan. They had a history. They were in Memphis. They did a a, a number of country and blues records and stuff. They were they were like it wasn't Nashville, it was Memphis, mm. and, and they had a lot of great albums were done there. There's a number of other artists that were there. Uh, so Sean Lane, Lane was a friend of Angelo Earls, mm. and Angelo was assigned to me as a producer doing my thing. Mm. When I get to this, he goes, hey, man, you know, I know Sean Lane. I'm like, oh, dog, I read about him in the Guitar Player magazine. And they said this dude was bad as shit. And he was like, here. He goes, yeah, I know Lane. We can go to his house, man. We boys. I was like, what? So, of course, we went to Sean's house. Sean has his light voice like Michael Jackson, right? Yeah. Talks yeah, like yeah. this. Yeah. Ain't like. He's up all night. He has all these videos. The big thing at the time was Laserdisc, which was the size of a record. Before it was like, everything was on DVD, compact disc. It was still experimental. He had a seven point surround stereo system. Everybody was just getting it a four point, five point surround. He was way ahead. Yeah. He had these, the record company, Warner Brothers, had advanced him. Jim Ed Norman signed his demo, which became Powers of Ten. Jim Ant Norman had signed Jocko and uh, was it uh, Take Six? He was like the jazzer guy mm. at Warner, and um, he signed Sean Lane's Powers of Ten, and uh, Sean took the money and bought some equipment and stuff like that. And when I met him, it was like a little bit before during that time. Mm. Um, now check this out: Sean Lane opened for me. During that video, that live video, yeah, this motherfucker is opening for me. I barely play guitar. I'm a songwriter on a guitar, right? Well, wow. Sean Lane is opening for me. I'm like, I gotta go after, go after this. After it was like Rick James 
looking at Prince, right? <laughs> oh my God! Like, really? Uh, and Eric Gales is in the audience looking at both of us. I'm like around real guitar players. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that was so hilarious. Wow. So humbling, and it was so positive. They were supporting me as a guitar player. Right, so and it was it was deep. I can't, I, I'm, I can't, I can't. It was really an opposition. <laughs> so I like doing my thing. I'm like, all right. And then and then Eric was like, later he's like, Sean, that shit you do on guitar was bad as shit. I'm like, really, dog, really? <laughs> and then Sean is doing his thing before him. That shit was crazy. It was like if I decided to like go surfing. And I went to bed, and I try to get out there on the wave for the first time, and I'm with these bad ass dudes to do it all the time. It's ridiculous. So anyway, <laughs> that happened yeah. at my showcase. And Sean was just so cool to hang with. He was so into music, and we were like brothers. We listened to the same records. We listened to Tree Like Girl 2 mm. and all these ECM records, and then we were listening to all the stuff in the 90s, and we were going real fused out because like the 90s was like doing some stuff to that kind of music. It was like an extension of the 70s, but it was in the 90s, and people get more technical than CDs, and mm. they were distributing Hendrix records with different mixes from Winterland. It was a really exciting time with music from the analog to digital transformation and for, and for musicians to really discover other musicians before the internet. Mm. And we got into pure recordings, and, and Sean was like that. When I went to Memphis, he goes, hey, man, can you come play drums on my... um." I, you know, I got this uh, thing with Warner Brothers, and we're gonna tour. He didn't really say much. How? He didn't say much. But I was 21, ready to get the fuck out of town, you know. And I was like, sure, man, let's go do it. And you know, we got this tour, and you know, we'll just like promote this record. So I packed up all my shit. I had a little Toyota Tercel, and I put a. Uh, I put a hitch trail on it. Yeah. Put my drum set, my TV set, my futon, all that. Wow. And I hitched it out to Memphis. Wow. Hooked up with some cat to find me an apartment. And I lived there for eight months. And we just gigged around Memphis. Wow. I perfected our. Yeah. Uh, he arranged that I had a place for my little personal studio because I had my reel and reels and my dad's and my studio and everything back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. And where we rehearsed, we did that little clinic thing. It's now on YouTube, like up for that roof attic place. Um, and then we went on tour and we did the Powers of Ten thing. Yeah. And we just, it was deep, man. Um, I think I made about, I know I made $500. <laughs> <laughs> I think it gave me $500. And I think they gave me another five. I want to say I made a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> Other cats didn't get shit. Yeah. Oh, God. It was a promo tour. Yeah. To promote the record. And, yeah. and what was cool was that Warner Brothers was sending out reps in different towns. And they're there. They're sent there to see how to market yo ass. That's what record companies used to do. Yeah, but yeah. But at the same time, the record company goes, so I was like, you know what these motherfuckers want to do? And I said, what? And he said, they're like, well, it's statistically proven. That's how they go. They go, Sean, make sure your record doesn't have a lot of snare drum because it's been statistically proven that motherfuckers who between the ages of 20 and 25 and listen to jazz records they don't want to hear a lot of backbeat in the snare drum so don't mix these that and is there a lot of distortion on the guitar and the record mix because it's been statistically proven that people who listen to jazz records don't want a lot of distorted guitar in their in their guitar it's been statistically proven <laughs> this is what the fucking nightmare in the record company is oh my god how you should be mixing your album. How you should your guitar tone, whatever yeah, yeah. snare drum shit. Right? Wow. So, so like all these musicians on Facebook are like, yeah, fix it be this I'm like, dog. You have never messed with a record company in your life. It's a nightmare. Yeah. And all those superstars we see, I saw this thing on what's his name? Uh what's that cat? Gino Vanelli. Yeah. I never knew a lot about that cat, but I knew he was serious. I knew he was like, whether I like this music or not, like these these cats, like Neil Diamond, I always thought he was a bad motherfucker because Neil was like, if you're a bad musician and you and you can play, 
I'm going to have a solo. I'm going to give you a solo feature because people are going to come see me because of you. Thanks so much for bringing your musicianship to these two pieces of music. Again, like when I first like loaded up the drum track in Logic, I was just grinning like a, like a little kid, man. So thank you so much for that. And thanks for, um, thanks for giving your time to chat now. And like, we love you in London, man. We, we were all at the Pizza Express when you played trio with, with Anthony and Steve. And uh, I actually, wow. we played Air Gin together at Ronnie Scott's that night. With, oh my God. Yeah. With Let's the, talk about that real quick. That was terrifying. Let me tell you what happened. What are you talking oh, about, man? We were so scared. We were so scared. We were like, oh shit, man, Sean Rickman's here. We got to play with him, but he's going to like roast us. It was great. I didn't want to play. Uh, I, was there with, I was there with Anthony and some friends. I really like it there, man. It's really cool because it's like, that's where Hendrix is hanging there. Anywhere Jimmy went, any, anything that has anything to do with Black Sabbath and Jimmy Hendrix and like the members of Ronnie James Dio. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Iron Maiden and shit like that. No. Um, uh, <laughs> that, that, that took a turn there. <laughs> yeah, right. See, um, no. So I, uh, y'all were wrapping up the night, and my friends were like, "Come on, Sean, go up and play." And I was like, "No, I'm not in shape." And I think we were there. I forgot we were there doing the residency kind of. Yeah, the, yeah. And so. Uh, there's a thing with Bill Bill Cos, Cosby. That's like not a good name to bring up right now. Bill Cosby was saying that he he thought he was like this hot shit drummer, and he went up and did his jam session. Yeah, oh yeah, with Sonny Stitt, with Sonny Stitt, right? And his whole hand swelled up. <laughs> he has blue drumsticks in his back pocket, <laughs> and he really and y'all did that. Y'all like you like one, two, one, two. I was like, oh shit. I gotta do that thing. Ling, 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 ling. Oh, <laughs> and you'd no. already done two sets. You'd already done two sets that night, you know, as well. Oh, that was great though. I like when I like how y'all put me on the edge, and um, I like a challenge. I like when you throw me out to the sharks. Oh like man, it. It, was great. it was great. I promise this is definitely the last thing. So if anyone's um, for anyone watching this, I, I met Sean at the Belgrade Jazz Festival and saw the the Steve Coleman band with Kokai. It was com completely amazing. I've never seen anything like that before. Do you know how that record's coming along? When's that going to be out? Because that's really, oh, really yeah. profound music. What well, is it live at the Village Vanguard Volume 1, which you can get at Pi Recordings. P-I, yeah. P is in Paul, I Recordings. And they also have the uh, Trickster. That's our record label for Trickster as well. The other group yeah. I'm in, a part of with Miles Okazaki and Anthony Tibbs as well and Matt Mitchell. Craig Taborn played it on the first record. Mm. Matt's on the second record. Uh, also, Pi, uh, there's some talk of putting out volume two with Kakai. Mm. And it's two albums greatly different. Matter of fact, I'm going to give you a sneak preview. Right? You Will you get in trouble? Yeah, but it's the end of the fucking world. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> And then let me fast forward a little bit. With a straight food, with the ice tree limbs, and tree limbs, and they lied about him and Silver, got still, and still drive with. So we got the name of the past still, and it's just the way that it's the human being. Then you caught the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of the way, and then you got the end of
Let's do it again, man. So send me some more stuff. This All is right, just man. the beginning. All right? Yeah. Thank you so much, Sean. All right, Andrew. Welcome. Peace. Have a good day. Bye, man. Peace.
Thank you so much. That's it for me. Um, huge thanks to Kevin. Huge thanks to Matt. Uber huge thanks to Sean, all the way over in Rockville, for, uh, for, for bringing it and making it happen. Um, yeah, if you, if you enjoyed this music and if you know anyone else who might enjoy it, do me a favor, just tag them in, then maybe they'll notice it. We want as many people to hear it as possible, obviously. Um, if I get things done in time, I might have a couple of tracks with Ari Honig um, for next week. So that's it from me. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been really fun. Thank you for all being very supportive. Lots of thumbs up and whatnot. Um, over and out. Cheers.